Good day, this is Lynette from Avisha Ministries. You are listening to Lighthouse Radio. Thank you so much for tuning in. We are proclaiming the truth of the Word of God. We believe in Jesus Christ. We are continuing with our deliverance manual. And the next chapter that we are going to discuss is called Generational Curses. There have been a lot of discussion surrounding generational curses. Some say it is obsolete or no longer part of the New Testament, while others feel it is still part and parcel of a believer's spiritual walk of freedom. From the onset, what should be understood is that in no way does a generational curse in any form or shape stand in the way of someone's salvation. Your sin is your sin, and the sin that Jesus forgives is the sin in your life. Salvation cannot be blocked because of a non-repented sin by your ancestors. That is false doctrine. Each person is accountable for their own sins and each person is saved individually from their own sin by the blood of Jesus Christ. When we therefore talk about generational curses, it is not about salvation, it is about being under the possible influence of a spiritual oppression or suffering, the possible consequences of such a curse. Thus, a generational curse is basically a defilement that was passed down from one generation to another. For example, if your parents have been heavily involved in a cult, then one can become defiled or polluted or unclean, or there was an op- uh, opening made uh, for, the, for the influence for the demonic activities. Another erroneous perception is that a generational curse is punishment by God. This is not true. A curse is broken because there is possible legal ground um, through the inner, the, where the enemy can operate in. Remember, life is in the blood. So a generational curse is given life by being passed down in the generational bloodline. It is rather safe than sorry to make sure the devil has no legal foothold in your life. What then about the blood of Jesus? Surely it cancels out all curses and the consequences of curse. Yes, it does, but before we answer this question more in depth, consider that the generational concept or general concept of a generational curse comes from scriptures such as Exodus 20 verse 5, 34, Numbers 14, Deuteronomy 5, 9, God warns that he is a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation um, of those who hate him. The Bible tells us that the sin of the parents can cause that same pollution to be handed down to their children. Lamentation 5.7 says, Our fathers have not sinned and are not, and we have borne their iniquities. However, you also get Ezekiel 18, which says, for example, what do you do you people mean by quoting this proverb about the land of Israel? The fathers eat our grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, you will no longer quote this proverb in Israel. Similar wording is found in Jeremiah 31 verse 29. In the context of mention of the coming Messiah, some claim that this indicates that when Jesus came, he did away with this proverb as far as Christians are concerned because all past sins, including generational sins, would be cancelled at the time of conversion. This is, however, a misinterpretation of these passages based on the assumption that Jeremiah and Ezekiel were talking about generational curses. They were in fact declaring a biblical proverb obsolete. Instead, they were confronting a commonly held false definition of generational curses based on an individual proverb <coughs> Excuse me. expressed a notion which had always been unbiblical that we are personally guilty for our father's sins. In the time of Jeremiah and Ezekiel, many people believed that when uh, fathers ate sour grapes, indulged in sins, um, it was just as if their children ate those same grapes or indulged in the same sin, and thus were personally guilty for their father's sins. They used this misinterpretation as as a pretense to accuse God. It was, however, the people, not God, who believed that children were to blame for their father's sins. 
this was an unjust belief. Ezekiel refuted this proverb by quoting Moses in Deuteronomy 24 verse 16. We're reading out the NIV. Fathers shall not put to death for their children, nor children put to death for their fathers. Each is to die for his own sin. In Jeremiah 31 verse 30, Jeremiah concurred. Instead, everyone will die for his own sin. Whoever eats sour grapes, his own teeth will set on edge. For in the mind of Moses, a generational curse did not mean we are personally guilty for our ancestors' sins. Rather, it means that we inherit the consequences of their sins. Moses, after all, wrote that because of Adam and Eve's sin, all women now have increased pain in childbearing, including tr Christian women, Genesis 3. While all may now have greater difficulty tilling the earth, including Christian men, Genesis 3.18. A generational curse thus means that we inherit a propensity towards the same sin our ancestors have committed, just as we have all inherited a sinful propensity propensity from our common ancestor Adam. The word propensity means that we have an inclination or natural tendency to behave in a particular way. But as Moses stated and Jeremiah um, and Ezekiel later affirmed, we are by no means personally guilty for Adam's sin. We are uh, guilty only for our own choices to give into and act upon the uh, propensities we have inherited from them. Jeremiah 31 implies that the proverb in question would no longer be spoken when the Messiah comes. Some therefore interpret Jeremiah's predicting that Jesus' death would automatically cancel generational curses uh, for born-again Christians, but they ignore the fact that Ezekiel says that this false proverb would no longer be quoted even in his own day. Generational curses as Moses defined them were not what Ezekiel and Jeremiah declared would come to an end either in their own lifetime or in the time of the Messiah. Rather, what would come to an end was the quoting of a very unbiblical proverb that should never have been spoken in the first place. What then about John 9? As he, Jesus, passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Again, what we find here is a reference back to Exodus 18, where the people believed the man was to be held personally responsible for the guilt of his parents. Jesus, as in the prophecy of Ezekiel, had to set the record straight that no one is guilty of someone else's guilt. Therefore, his blindness has nothing to do with what his parents did or he himself did. He was simply unfortunate. It is also true in Romans 8 verse 1, it says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Condemnation means to declare guilty, to inflict a penalty upon. Yes, we are not guilty of the sins of our forefathers, but this does not mean we cannot somehow have inherited the spiritual repercussion of their actions. Therefore, the mistake made when it comes to generational curses is that God keeps the curse in place as a punishment. This is incorrect. The curse is in place because of the devil's work and he wishes to influence his generation after generation. Think about this way. The day that Jesus saved us, our spirit is restored and healed. But our soul needs to undergo its own radical transformation. We need to undergo a renewing of the mind, the change of heart and the laying down of our will. That is a process made by the disciple on a daily basis. It is not something that happens overnight. Someone who was a drug addict and who gets saved will still struggle with the consequences of the addiction such as physical cravings and the psychological scars. Unless the addiction was caused by a, de a definite demonic entity and delivered, such an ad addict needs to undergo the restoration of the soul. His spirit may be saved, but he has a long way to go in terms of overcoming the addiction. It doesn't happen overnight. 
This is the same with generational curses. The curse is broken by the blood, but the lingering consequences could have left scars in a soul or in the flesh that needs to be remedied daily. So yes, it is true what Galatians 3.13 says. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. We have been freed from the bondage of the generational curse. We don't have to do anything to break the curse because it's already been done by Christ. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. John 8.36 it is the same with the argument regarding sin. If Jesus died for our sins, does this mean we don't have to do anything to walk blameless before the Lord? Of course not. Every day we will battle the temptation of the flesh, the world and the devil. Every day, consciously, we need to make the right decision, renew the mind, guard the heart and die to the self. Therefore, we cannot merely say that because Jesus has died for us that we don't need to do anything to restore the soul. To restore the soul is very much up to us under the guidance of the Lord. We have a free will so it is up to us how we are going to handle issues in our life that comes from our past and even from our forefathers. It therefore remains a reality that problems are passed down from generation to generation. It is quite evident that even as grandchildren look like their grandparents, many of them share the same weaknesses, problems and even illnesses. Some will say that this is the natural man, yet in the spiritual realm that we do do has an impact and that this is an, uh, has consequences that can even affect our children. Generational curses are beyond learned behavior because it is a spiritual bondage that is passed down from one generation to another. Some symptoms of a generation curse are a continual negative pattern of something being handed down from a generation to generation. Generational curses has nothing to do with being punished, but it has to do with being susceptible within the realm of the soul of, um, to the actions of our forefathers. Why is this? Because such actions has given the devil legal ground to act, and unless the legal ground in our lives is removed, he will continue to influence and to harass us. Often people who are adopted end up with the same characteristics as their birth parents, not because they were around their birth parents to learn how they behaved, but because they inherited their spiritual bondage. Some common symptoms of generational curses are family illnesses that seem to just walk from one person down to the next. Cancer is common physical manifestation of a spiritual bondage. Continual financial difficulties. They continually hit roadblocks in their finances. Mental problems. Uh, persistent irrational fears and depression. Anything that seems to be a persistent struggle or problem was handed down from one generation to another may very well be a generational curse. If you struggle with the same bondages as your parents or see siblings with the same problem, then it is quite possible that you are suffering from the effects of a generational curse. Many times when we see three generational suffering from depression, then it can be a generational curse at work. There is, however, a trend in the church today to try to blame every sin and problem on some sort of generational curse. We also make our own choices in life that has nothing to do with generational curses. When we walk in idolatry, rebellion, or we choose to take certain actions or behave in a certain way, it cannot at, it cannot at all times be ascribed to a generational curse. After all, we all grow up as children and become influenced negatively or positively. Throughout our lives, we ensure events that happen to us negatively or positively and just so negatively or positively we impact other people. This is why generational curses cannot also be seen as the culprit when someone makes the wrong decision or act in a way that seems ungodly. 
There can be many reasons and so we need to at all times to allow the Holy Spirit to lead and to guide us so that we can walk in discernment and understanding. What is important to note is that the power of a generational sin or curse causes uh, or something that's caused by the sins of the forefathers however are automatically broken at the time a person receives salvation or is filled by the Holy Spirit but the unclean spirit that entered in before they accepted Jesus still needs to come out other generational curses such as encountered in Freemasonry need to be renounced and broken in order to be set free from them once a curse is broken the next step is to drive out the spirits that may have entered in because of that curse the cure for a generational curse has always been salvation when israel turned from idols to serve the living god the curse was broken and god saved them judges 3 9 and 1 samuel 12 10 Yes, God promised to visit Israel's sin upon the third and fourth generation, but in the very next verse He pro promised them that He would show love to a thousand generations of those who love Him and keep His commandments. Ex Exodus 20 In other words, God's grace lasts a thousand times longer than His wrath. We break the curse when we turn away from darkness and we embrace the light. We break the curse when we allow ourselves to be touched and embraced by the King of Heaven. For the Christian who is worried about a generational curse, the answer is salvation through Jesus Christ. A Christian is a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5. How can a child of God still be under God's curse? Romans 8. The cure for a generational curse is faith in Christ, repentance of sin. This is specifically applicable when casting out the demonic presence and a life consecrated to the Lord, Romans 12, 1. Indeed, Christ was made a curse, so we can be freed from the curses that sin, both our sins and those of our forefathers, has brought us. Galatians 3, 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Once you become a child of God, no longer will the sin of your forefathers cause curses to transfer into your life. So why are there so many believers who seem to be living under a generational curse? Remember, any bondage that was already passed down to you before you came into covenant with God has been be broken by Jesus Christ. The legal grounds are certainly paid for on the cross and therefore broken. The only thing left to do is to cast out any spirit that have gained entrance before you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. When it comes to generational curses, just as demons don't automatically leave at the time of salvation, they may have infested the soul. Neither do the, uh, the demons that you get from your ancestors automatically leave your, you either. If demons have entered you through curses handed down to you before you became a Christian, then those demons may need to be cast out. Demons often leave on their own accord, and when they don't, the remedy is to get rid of them by casting them out. Thus, when we break the generational curse, then the legal doorway has been closed, but now we need to clean the temple of the Lord, for such filthy remains. Let us read in Mark 9, 17. And one of the, uh, thr the strong replied to him, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a dumb spirit. And where, wherever he lays hold of him, so as to make him his own, it dashes him down and convulses him, and he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth, and he falls into a motionless stupor, and is wasting away. And I asked your disciples to drive it out, and they were not able to do it. And he answered them, O oh, unbelieving generation, without any faith, how long shall I have to do with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. So they brought the boy to him. 
And when the spirit saw him at once, it completely convulsed the boy, and he fell to the ground and kept rolling about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, How long has he had this? And he answered, From the time he was a little boy, and has often thrown him both into the fire and into water, intending to kill him. But if you can do anything, do have pity on us and help us. And Jesus said, You say to me, If you can do anything, why? All things can be and are possible to him who believes. At once the father of the boy gave an eager, piercing, inarticulate cry with tears, and he said, Lord, I believe. Constantly help my weakness of faith. But when Jesus noticed that a crowd of people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You dumb and deaf spirit, I charge you to come out of him and never go into him again. And after giving a hoarse, uh, clamoring, fear-stricken shriek of anguish and convulsing him terribly, it came out, and the boy lay pale and motionless like a corpse, so that many of them said, He is dead. But Jesus took a strong grip of his hand and began lifting him up, and he took, and he stood. What Jesus was dealing with was most likely a generational curse. In verse 21, the boy allowed himself to be embraced by Jesus, and so by the touch which we can view as a touch of salvation under the new covenant, the curse was broken. Now Jesus simply had to cast out the demons that entered in through the curse. A generational curse is something we need to be aware of, and we need to address it as guided by the Holy Spirit. Again, we cannot blame everything for generational curses, but we need to be aware that it does exist and that we can still sit with the consequences of demonic oppression after we have, uh, after we have to Jesus. One of the best ways to identify if there is any possibility of a generational curse is to study the behavior of one parent and their parents. If there is a negative pattern, pray over it and seek the Lord's guidance. Those who are a generational curse but who have not come to the Lord are deemed to repeat the mistakes of their parents. But even if we have come under the blood and have broken the curse, we still need to make sure that all demonic forces attached to the curse are also cast out. The Lord wants us to be free, completely and utterly. For the believer, the blood has done all the work on the cross, but for the unbeliever, the power of the curse remains. This should be another incentive why we should lead people to Jesus so that the curse of the devil and the old man can be broken once and for all. Let us always remember the glorious words of Paul in Colossians 1 when he wrote about the price that Jesus paid to set us free. I'm reading out of the Amplified. Paul, an apostle, special messenger of Christ Jesus the Messiah, by the will of God and Timothy our brother, to the saints, the consecrated people of God, and believing and faithful, brethren in Christ who are at Colossae, grace, spiritual favor, and blessing to you and, and peace from God our Father. We continually give thanks to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ the Messiah, as we are praying for you, we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, the, the lean, uh, leaning of your entire human personality on him, in absolute trust and confidence in his power, wisdom and goodness, and of the love which you have and show for all saints, God's consecrated ones. Because of the hope of experiencing what is laid up, preserved and waiting for you in heaven, of this hope you heard. In the past, in the message of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you, indeed, in the whole world, this gospel is bearing fruit and still is growing by its own inherent power, even as it is done among yourselves, ever since the day you were first heard and came to know and understand the grace of God in truth. You came to know the grace or undeserved favor of God in reality, deeply and clearly and thoroughly becoming acutely, accurately and um, intimately acquainted with it. You so learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ in our stead and as our representative and yours. 
Also he has informed us of your love in the Holy Spirit. For this reason we also from the day we heard of it have not ceased to pray and make special requests for you, asking that you may be filled with the full deep and clear knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom, in com comprehensive insight into the ways and purposes of God, in understanding and discernment of spiritual things, that you may walk li and live and conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him and desiring to please Him in all things, bearing fruit in every good work and steadily growing and increasing in and by the knowledge of God with fuller, deeper and clear clearer insight, acquaintance and recognition we pray that you may be invigorated and strengthened with all power according to the might of his glory to exercise every kind of endurance and patience perseverance and forbearance with joy giving thanks to the father who has qualified and made us fit to share the portion which is the inheritance of the saints god's holy people in the light the father has delivered and drawn us uh, to himself out of the control and dominion of darkness and has transferred us into the kingdom of the son of his love in whom we have our redemption through his blood which means the forgiveness of our sins now he is the exact likeness of the unseen god the visible representation of the invisible he is the firstborn of all creation for it is it was in him that all things were created in heaven and on earth earth things seen and things unseen whether thrones dominions rulers authorities all things were created and exist through him by his service intervention and in and for him and he himself existed before all things and in him all things consist are held together he also is the head of his body the church seeing he is the beginning the firstborn from among the dead so that he alone in everything and in every respect may occupy the chief place stand first and be preeminent for it has pleased the father that all the divine fullness the sum total of the divine perfection powers and attributes should dwell in him permanently and god purposed that through by the service of intervention of him the son all things should be completely reconciled back to himself whether on earth or in heaven as through him the father made peace by means of the blood of his cross and although you at one time were strange and alienated from him and were of hostile attitude of mind in your wicked activities yet now as christ the messiah reconciled you to god in the body of his flesh through death in order to present you holy and faultless and irreproachable to his father's presence and this he will do provided that you continue to stay with with and in the faith in christ well grounded and settled and steadfast not shifting or moving away from the hope which rests on and is inspired by the glad tidings the gospel which you have heard and which you have been preached as being designed for and offered without restriction to every person under heaven and of which gospel i paul became a minister thank you for listening to lighthouse radio i'm going to stop there for now with this chapter please come and join us again next week um, i will talk about soul ties and may god bless each one who has tuned into lighthouse lighthouse radio please support this radio station um, all the details are on their website at lighthouse radio please uh, go look at their website follow this ministry support this ministry so into this ministry you will be saying on great ground and uh, may god bless you may he keep you in this week and may his hand be upon you may his face shine upon you and may he bring you peace peace shalom to you